Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Award season is upon us. Oscar finalists were recently announced, and as in years past, this season of Below the Line will feature film professionals assessing the nominees in their category of expertise. Now, if you think of the Oscar series as a 10-course meal, you might consider today's episode an amuse-bouche, as I've reconvened a panel of my assistant director friends to discuss the movies nominated by the Directors Guild in the category of theatrical feature film. The ceremony for the 75th DGA Awards will be held on February 18th. Let me introduce my returning guests. Katie Carroll, you're a member of the Directors Guild, currently working as a first AD. Welcome back. Thanks, Kid. Happy to be back. Happy to see you. Also returning is Bill Hardy, DGA member, first AD, and sometime producer. Bill, nice to see you again. Hey, Skid. Next, Roger Mendoza, DGA member and currently working as a second AD. Good to see you. Hi, Skid. And then finally, Sean O'Banion, who is still not a member of the DGA, but is both a member of the Producers Guild of America and a fellow podcaster. Welcome. Thank you for letting me join your DGA party. Yeah, we'll tease you about that later, but you know what you're getting into when you came on. It's the fourth year we've done this. Happy to see all of you again. First, for listeners who have not necessarily been following the nominations, I'll list the five films we're going to discuss today. One, Tar. Two, Top Gun Maverick. Three, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Four, The Banshees of Inishirin. And five, The Fablemans. We're going to discuss those nominees alphabetically in order of the director's last name. Listeners, this is your spoiler warning. First up, Todd Field for Tar. Who wants to kick us off? Right off the bat, I'm like, well, this one's a movie um, (laughs) and there are people in it. That perfectly describes my sentiment. Yes. I, I enjoyed it. I, I I mean, but you know, it's uh, Todd Field's got a very unique uh, sub uh, niche within uh, artsy movies, I think, and they're quiet and well focused and uh, character studies. And that was like this one is very uh, focused on the music. I thought the credits were probably this sounds horrible. The credits were the coolest part about the movie. I really liked the focus on the music within the credits. Uh, How did did he do it? He did all the crew at the beginning, I think. So at the end, it was only the titles of the music that were played and who uh, who wrote, who performed. You know, I I fell into the trap, too. That was the other interesting thing was halfway through the movie. I was like, well, I wonder if Kate Blanchett, how much she looks like this uh, Lydia Tarr person. And then Googled it and spent two minutes going, wait a minute, she's not a real person. So everybody be ready for that. <laughs> I Googled it about 10 minutes into that beginning Q&A sequence when they were like, she's an EGOT. She has an Emmy, a Grammy. And I was like, wait, she has an Oscar? I don't know who this person is. <laughs> Fictional. Fictional. Got it. Okay. I enjoyed it. However, those are the best things I think I have to say about the movie. The one thing I really liked at the beginning is when she's in the classroom, there's a wonder where the camera is just moving all over the place. And like, I'm a sucker for a really good one. Or I even rewound that scene and watched it again. That Steadicam guy had to hold that Steadicam for a solid 10 minutes. It's not nothing. And then the rest of the movie, very little camera movement. I'm like, okay, now I'm just sitting here watching this and I'm watching amazing actors, but then I'd rather go to a theater. It's like, like Bring some movie magic with it. And what the movies bring is camera movement or telling your story with camera. It was very, very still. It was like, I... okay. And yeah, when you're starting to look at your phone a lot in a movie, it's like, that's never a good sign. It's definitely a movie that lives and dies by the performances. And, and mm-hmm. I would say also the screenplay, because I found it interesting that it's not just a condemnation of this type of personality, but also by the enablers of that type of personnel is a lot of characters who kind of you get the feel that they know what's going on with this woman but they all make a living because of her or around her and therefore they let her behave the way she behaves which of course we've seen a lot in this industry over these years yeah it's interesting character study but then the way to do it is to make the protagonist a lesbian woman so that you're not getting mad at all of the enablers of white men it's still enablers but yes I found it funny that they compared um, the Me Too movement to uh, Nazis post World War II. Just yeah. everybody's trying to hire. I was like, Come on, that's that's 
it's not even the same thing. I also, <laughs> I, I, I also didn't um, didn't appreciate the way that they glossed around the issue, right? Like, like you don't see anything from the accusers. You don't really know what she's being accused of. You just know that she's done something inappropriate because she's surrounded by a bunch of talented young ladies that she could have her ways with, I guess. But you never really see what those what those moments are, other than that snippet of video that you keep they keep replaying of her and her class. They don't really tell you what it is that she did. So you, you you don't understand the weight of it throughout the whole film. And you get to the end and you know she's out, but it seems like she's a she's a really she, he, he created a really good screenplay where he made this really great liar. She's been lying about her entire life throughout this entire film and who she is and who she became was all her manifesting this lie. Because when she goes home, you find out she's from Long Island or Jersey <laughs> and her name is Linda, not Lydia. <laughs> yeah. I would have been fascinated to see the screenplay directed by somebody else. Like I'm wondering if a different director could have taken this exact screenplay and done something. I mean, yes, they would have done something different, but still how different and better, worse, I think I like this film more than any of you. I actually think it's a really, really well done film. I think it's helpful to know something about Todd Field's other work before you start this movie. And I was very much reminded of In the Bedroom, which I thought was a fantastic film and where a lot of the dramatic moments happen off camera. And I had a similar sort of expectation as this started to unfold to take a different tack than you, Roger. I thought it worked really well that she walks into the room where they're going to review her uh, membership at her charity organization. And we don't see that scene because we know from the scene what happens and spending time with her. And so I saw it in the theater with the expectations that it was going to be slow and deliberate. Um, and I found it extremely rewarding. I thought it was masterful. I'm very happy to see it on this list. And I'm glad he was the director because I think both the screenplay and, and the style and how it, how it unfolded, it's very much of his other work. And I liked seeing it. I watched it twice. I'm not saying I didn't like it. I, I, I just think that, that maybe there's something about a white man that's a director in Hollywood directing something about me too that, that seems like he glossed over it a little bit, if that makes any sense. The, like the comparing the Nazis to me to right. movement being accused of things that you didn't do. And that you start to sort of sympathize with the victimizer. Right. And instead he put a woman in that position to try to make it more relatable. But, it, but it, it, I think it's all the same thing. And I mean, you did and, and things like not going over how it affected her relationship with her, with her wife, right. That was also glossed over. And I feel like that could have been a very important moment. Character development is to, you know, if, if they said how how hard it was for them when they decided to come become public with their relationship, why wouldn't you have a bigger moment than just that one scene where where she confronts her and she avoids it? Well, there he did make a very specific choice. I think that I I think there's only maybe two moments in the film where she's not in the scene. So everything in the film, we only see what Lydia sees or knows. And so that that puts us at a loss, right? Because we don't know where she was before and what she did. So when we start, you know, she's in this high position and it's slowly being stripped away and she's starting to feel that. I thought that was that was very interesting. And I also thought in terms of the design of the film, the even from the production design, the you know, the very German, the German angles of things and that concert hall in Berlin is fantastic. And all that kind of stuff. So I thought he really made some very specific choices. I don't know if all of them worked for me, but it's not that I didn't like the film. I, I definitely respect the movie. I certainly respect Kate Blanchett's performance, but it wasn't my favorite. And I'm of the opinion that if you had added some of those scenes you're asking about, Roger, it would have reduced the impact of what I think is one of the best scenes in the movie. And that's where she bum rushes the orchestra conductor and at the moment leading up to that because we haven't been true dare i say spoon fed the sort of development where she is and then when you realize what happens and then sort of the aftermath we don't really know what's happened to her later either until you get to the very end and you see well she's not doing as well as she was and i think again deliberate and i really enjoyed the way it unfolded so i this is one of my favorites of the year i, I can't say that i didn't love the movie i thought it was it was very well done Maybe it was something to be said about how somebody that's in that position of power would lie their way to the top and then lie 
their way to the bottom. George Santos? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> never, never once does she admit any wrongdoing. You never see her actually admit it. I thought that was that was brave. It was brave to do cinematically. And how they did it and got you to the end where she's playing a, you know, <laughs> playing for a video game. <laughs> what all of you said, I think it, it goes back to that idea of uh she's living in her own bubble it's it's her own personal experience it's not the experience of what she did and how it affected all these other people it goes back to that idea of that it's really just a character study it's purely just this one character and how these events affected them but their warped perception of the world affects how these things affected them i think that's a problem the fact that it doesn't always come through to the audience that way i think that it gets misinterpreted down the road how much do you think that was todd's field directing kate blanchett or kate blanchett herself making those choices for the character i think it was in the screenplay because everyone else is aware of how the story is broken in the media and how it's affecting everyone else's perception of her whereas she's so far off in her own artistic bubble that she doesn't even recognize what she did wrong or care how it's affecting anyone else so it's very personalized to her she's like yeah she's an extremely selfish and egotistical character who really doesn't seem at any point concerned with how anybody responds to what she says or what she does i also don't think todd field intends it as a me too movie to look at it that way. There's a lot of Me Too movies this year and dealing with this issue. And I don't think his intention, you know, in waiting 15 years between films and putting this together, it's certainly on his mind that, but I don't think that's the story he's trying to tell here. Um, I think it's something else. And I think that while, you know, Kate Blanchett is a collaborator with him in this, and, and I think she'll get credit for the role, uh, I do think it's his vision of this film that finally came together. He's the auteur. I mean, in terms of the direction, yeah, there's what's on the page. There's whatever they might have discussed in, in, in prep, right? And then ultimately, if you're casting Kate Blanchett, you kind of just let her do what she's going to do. I mean, what you, you know, you can't, <laughs> what are you going to tell her? She's pretty fantastic. So, anybody change their minds over the course of this? <laughs> <laughs> Say, I, didn't. No, I, I, I liked it. Yeah, I didn't not like it. I can absolutely, like as Sean said, I very much respect it. But on the long list of movies from this year, oh, I want to watch that again. It's it's not even on that list. I've seen it. I respect it. Don't need to see it again. The one thing that uh, is consistent uh, that I will have to say about each film, I liked it more than Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's our segue, right? <laughs> Leading into our second film, Joseph Kaczynski has been nominated for Top Gun Maverick. Now, we already know what Bill thinks. Maybe somebody else give us an assessment of uh, <laughs> Top Gun Maverick. Bill is the one guy that contributed to a billion plus box office that didn't like it. <laughs> I mean, I, the, uh, here, let me, I'll go again first. Uh, I'll, I'll set the tone. <laughs> the biggest input this film had into film history is that Tom Cruise allowed himself to be seen in a two shot with someone a foot taller than him for the first time in <laughs> since the, in the first time since he was standing opposite Anthony Edwards in the first Top Gun movie. <laughs> in Minority Report there's these scenes with Max von Sydow where the, it's uh, over Tom Cruise's shoulder and his head looks like a little pea in the foreground with Max Sydow's head in the back in the <laughs> background. And vice versa, you know, you're seeing a piece of Max's ear where it's a full headshot of Tom Cruise. That's the first thing I thought when I saw this movie was that he is really short and that tall people aren't allowed to fly in jets is the other thing. As far as I understand it, like that was one of those things when I went to the Naval Academy, like on tours as a little kid, I was like, oh, nobody over 5'8 is allowed to fly a jet. Like I'm about 10 years old at 5'10 going. I don't understand. Why can't I? <laughs> Side note. Sorry. If we're going to start realistically tearing this movie apart, <laughs> it's going to be a very downhill conversation. What do people think, again, of the film that, uh, as noted, has done amazing at the box office and it's made this list? 
Is that the only reason it's there? Because it was the first movie to bring the audiences back after the long hiatus that we've had? I mean, in terms of directorial achievement, right? It, it's it's a pretty stunning undertaking. I mean, it was stunning back in the day when Tony Scott did absolutely some actual shooting with these planes, much less creating the technology to put the cameras in the planes, getting DOD approval to put actors in the planes telling them how to turn the cameras on and shoot stuff themselves. I mean, like that. Filming it, on aircraft carriers in the middle of the ocean. like yeah. Right, but, that, but wasn't that a bigger achievement when it was done the first time? Not necessarily. This may be, and I thought about this because I honestly went back last night and was like, it's got to be me. Well, it is me. But it's got to be I gave the movie a second chance. And when I went back and watched it, it was that opening section it was pretty much the credit sequence on the deck of the ship. Okay. I was like, maybe the ADs really came out for this one. It was like, you know what? This movie was hard as shit, and I'm going to nominate this. So it, if anything, though, I think it was an anti-art vote that got it. <laughs> I don't yeah, think, that I it don't was think... like, let's love the movies again. Like, yeah. everything else we could talk about, like, how artistic it is or what, what its importance is something like top gun and again it's like that it's not the marvel that it's a giant massive movie and it makes you appreciate going to the movies i mean i think we're all roughly of the age where like this is one of the first big movies we saw so it's also a little bit of nostalgia let's be honest like, like everyone who's now our age range who's in the dga who's nominated was like yeah that that's what got me the first time you know but also on top of that I think a lot of us went in expecting it to be like, okay, yeah, it'll be okay. It'll be nostalgic, whatever. And then I thought it was a really good movie. It told an interesting story. It told it well. It didn't tell it in three and a half hours. It had great music. It got you a feeling. I got chills when I watched it. And I was like, I can't wait, wait to see this. I'm so excited. And it was, I thought it was very good. I, I heard Bruckheimer in an interview and he said, you know, people after 36 years, people come into this movie with their arms folded. Yes. Like I'm expecting this to suck. I love yes. the original, whether the original is a great, you know, great art or not debatable. But like you said, we grew up with that, right? It was like prime age. We were all probably like, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. And that was like the movie of the summer in 86. Mm -hmm. So we all went into this going, this can't possibly be good. Like right. it's not going to live up to to my personal memory of 1986 of sitting in the you know movie theater in Sacramento, California and watching those jets take off that carrier. And then it did. And for me, not only did it meet my expectations of what I hoped it could be, starting with using the original, you know, Faltermeyer music over the logos and the, you know, the bell as the title treatment comes up. Double but lighting it, logo at the top. Yeah, yeah. And Don Simpson, Jerry Bruckheimer production. You're like, whoa, that's wild. But then it exceeded it because I didn't even know that I needed to see Maverick back in an F-14. I like the F-14s, but like when I got to that, I was like, holy crap. Like they're actually going, they're giving me more than I thought I was going to get. So I appreciated that. I think I agree. Was Bill, did you make that point or Katie that, that I mean, when you're watching it, the director, the AD team, yeah, they earned it. They did. Yeah. As far as all the other films, that this this was probably the hardest to make. Yeah, exactly. The AD standpoint. If nothing else, you know that just being on a boat makes things that much harder. And in a plane. And a plane yeah. on a boat. Actors on a plane starting their own cameras. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, I start sweating just thinking about all the accidents that could have happened. I can tell you one story from because I know uh, the location manager who's now uh, retired named Mike Fantasia, who many of you have probably worked with over the years. They had scheduled a day on that carrier and they went out. They sent a, a skeleton crew out the night before they get in their berths on the carrier and they're supposed to depart at like 5 a.m. I forget what they call it. They don't call it depart, but 5 a.m. the next morning is, that ship is supposed to go out and they get what they get. The next morning, apparently a fantail broke on the carrier and it couldn't leave so they were stuck and they had nothing else to do so they pulled scenes from the end of the movie that weren't supposed to be on the carrier reset them into the carrier had the navy move stuff out of that big you know basement and continued to shoot until they could actually go out wow 
the fact that you have like a giant fantail on an aircraft carrier break, yet you still find things to shoot that help the story. That's yeah. not a small achievement. I want to express maybe a more nuanced take on this film overall. I, I really enjoyed seeing it in the theater, but the story itself, I don't think it's a very good movie. It really only is as successful as it is because of the nostalgia factor. They do like a head fake towards modernity. You know, there's female pilots and maybe Mavericks learn the lesson of his ways and these sort of things. But in the end, they still revert to what we enjoyed about the original film. It's still a couple of white guys saving the day. The military story itself doesn't make any sense. The foreign country we're against with all this technology doesn't make any sense. Like none of that stuff, if not for the Top Gun aspect, if someone brought you this script, you would not produce this movie. You would say, no, there's no story here. It's not relevant to the times. You haven't captured anything. But the fact that it does both manage to bring back the memories of the other movie, build on it and make it so enjoyable. That I think is the actual accomplishment with this film. That's a pretty tough rope to walk. Like That's a pretty tight line to stick to where you manage to do all those things. They got the assignment and they delivered. And so in that sense, I don't think this movie should actually be on this list for the top five as far as directors go. It is in my top 20 for the year, again, just because they managed an assignment that is actually very difficult. And we know it's difficult because time and time again, we see films try similar things, revisit an old property, and they don't manage to walk that line. They fail on both sides of that, and or they try too much. And this film tried exactly enough and delivered exactly. And so in that sense, I'm very impressed. Again, I don't think it's, it should be in the top five films on my list, but it is in the top 20 and I don't mind getting this attention. If Top Gun had not existed in 1986, this script on its own would be horrible and laughable and no one would see it, but it also wouldn't get the budget. It probably wouldn't get greenlit at all. It exists because Top Gun exists in 1986. So arguably, I, I still haven't decided, making a sequel 37 years later is even more difficult because you have to incorporate that nostalgia as opposed to starting from scratch. And you have to figure out all that nostalgia, but still try and modernize it to some extent. It, it is almost a tighter rope to walk. I feel like I go into it that I'm very impressed with the film and I enjoyed it. I'm happy that people enjoyed it. But when people start talking about, oh, it's the best picture and that sort of thing, I have to roll my eyes a little bit because I feel like we need a little art in this whole conversation. And this movie is about uh, execution. I don't think it's about art. Honestly, I was surprised that it was on the DGA nominees list. I, it didn't bother me that it was there again, because you're rewarding the whole the director's entire team and what they accomplished is stunning here. It's like, eh, OK, I mean, good for them, which, by the way. Unit production manager, one of the two, uh, Tommy Harper, guy I used to PA with. Yes. Awesome guy. Yeah, I think you PA'd with him when I was working with him. Yes. Yeah. First AD here was the key second for another AD on our list that we'll come to. Yeah, and the second second, Andrew Stahl. He used to PA for me before he was in the DGA. It's like, yeah, it's old home week. Like when I watch the credits, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I know the camera assistant. I know those prop guys. Like, that's for it's like, so, and I also know so many of the crew who also grew up watching the first Top Gun. So I could appreciate the crew's point of view of, oh my God, I get to work on this movie. So that alone, like if I got called to work on that oh, in a heartbeat, I would go PA for a day on that movie just to say that I did. <laughs> just to get the t-shirt. <laughs> exactly. All right. I will do some outreach and maybe ask for your help. We'll try to do an episode of the podcast where some of that crew comes and talks actually behind the scenes with us. Uh, in the meantime, if there's nothing else, we'll move on to the third film on our list. Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert are nominated for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. It's my favorite movie on the list. Roger, say more. <laughs> I think they took the, 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 all the difficulty of being on a boat <laughs> and added all the art that you said the other movie was missing. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was such a great fantasy. It had such a great story. They don't win, I'll be really upset. They should win the best adapted screenplay for sure. This is a wonderful film. I, I thought it was great. Um, Michelle should get a best actress nod when the Oscars roll around because she was delightful. And there should be a best supporting actress for Joy Shu. She should definitely get one. This movie was, it just had everything. I always hoped that the Daniels would get to make bigger films and get more, more notice. Um, 
I made a really, really small short film with them in Miami called Omniboat, um, where they made a, a movie about a dad being a boat. He was a boat. <laughs> they kind of do that in Swiss Army Man, don't they? Didn't they do a similar? Yeah, yeah, something similar to that. They're just really good guys. I thought it was what a what a great movie, and I, I'm glad that they're getting noticed finally. They they've been great since music videos. Every time I thought about this movie, I would want to watch Turn Down for what or whatever the actual title of the song is, and then I would watch the video and be like, "How weird is that? That this video is actually seems to work with everything. Seems to like as a counterpart, like it almost." I, I've always loved the video, and the, I loved the movie, too. I'm completely with you. It was my vote for number one. Tell me more about the video, because I'm not sure I understand that context. I might be missing something. It's called, it's called Turn Down for What. It's a video where, essentially, this guy is in an apartment. He starts listening to music, right? And then he he starts jumping in his apartment to you know get excited about the song. Goes through the floor into the next apartment, and then those people go through the floor into the next, and it's just this continual like craziness. Because the Daniels directed that video as well, and you're seeing similar connections between the style that they brought to that with what we're seeing evidenced on this. Uh, film. Yes, and for everybody that goes, this movie is too artsy fartsy or whatever. It's a multiverse movie, so all you Marvel people go watch it for that reason, and I promise you'll love it afterwards. You'll all be obsessed with a giant donut floating in the sky. Like there are so many little cool things when you're watching it that stay with you to the next day. Not only was it visually striking and had the performances, it stayed with me for the next week. I kept thinking about different parts of it that I really enjoyed. I don't remember what their schedule was. I, I think I've heard them mention, but I know they made the movie for $14 million. Really? Locations and costumes alone my mind was blown. I mean, every time they cut, you're seeing what looks like a hundred different places. They can't have had a VFX budget to just CG everything. So even if they did some work, I mean, they had to go shoot this stuff, which just seems incredible to me. It, it, the movie, you know, sort of stylistic, I, I guess not stylistically, because I like the style of it, but it didn't work for me all the way story-wise, but visually and creatively in terms of what they were accomplishing, it, it was incredible. I finally only watched this last week and I kept hearing how amazing it was and I did love it, but I think if I had seen it last summer when it first came out, I might've loved it just a little bit more as opposed to hearing, oh, it's the best movie ever. It's the best movie ever. It's the best movie ever. It's like, oh yeah, no, it's really good. I don't know that it's the best movie ever. And I'd heard, you know, hot dog fingers and butt plugs and I'd heard all of that stuff. So I think I wasn't as surprised as I could have been. So I'm trying to view it without all of that stuff in my head. It's fantastic. Also, just again, from the AD point of view, at the end, when we're flashing on their faces and there's maybe upwards of a hundred, I'm like, every single scene, did they end up doing a shot just for that little bit at the end? And how long does that take to do? And if it's only $14 million, they couldn't have that many days to shoot. The amount of destruction they did in that IRS office, like, and redo, and probably times when they like, well, okay, well, we only only got one shot at this. Don't mess it up. But not a planned one or where you can do it again if you need to. Like, no, we can only break this up once. We can only explode this once. Don't screw up. Like, okay, <laughs> sure. It can be a little overwhelming. I mean, there's so much going on in every shot. That's what I was sort of calling, not just costumes, but production design. I know that they said, we're going for quantity here. Pack yes. the background, pack this office with just stuff everywhere. We're never going to see stuff long enough for people to analyze it. Just, you know, fill the space. This is where the benefit of having two directors probably kicked in because one of them goes and does one thing, you know, goes with this little second unit, his cameraman, and shoots all the million shots of the faces while somebody else is blowing up the building. I think they have a very, very defined vision and they've had it since the very beginning. And, and to have two people be in sync and be able to put out such a great story because underlying all the effects and the butt plug and the fanny pack fights and there's the, there's a really great story about a mother and a daughter trying to come together. And that's also, that also creates the antagonist in the story, which is, which is wonderful. And if you strip all that away, it's it's just a story about an immigrant family trying to understand each other in America. 
this is the only film this year i think that i forgot i was watching a movie sort of that and i just went for the ride and yeah while there are certain elements that would not have been my creative choice i got a little weary of hot dog fingers by the end of the film for example just like that didn't work for me on the same level that i think it worked for the daniels that being said i was just along for the ride and and it is an interesting point i saw it in the theater And also the two films we discussed earlier as well with Tar and Top Gun Maverick. And so all three of these cases, there is something about being committed and in the dark and watching the film that I think added to my enjoyment of all three of those films. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like I'm just getting old because one of my favorite scenes was just the rocks talking to each other. (laughs) (laughs) I love that scene. I love that scene too. And it's at just the right time where there's all this frenetic energy and then... (laughs) Take a pause. But it's still so important with that larger theme, as Roger talked about, there is this actually really nuanced and well-delivered story at the heart of this. Yeah. I can't get over how wonderful it was for for something so goofy. No, but also like just the production design inside that apartment. Like you were saying, Sean, like, oh, just put something there. We won't be able to really identify it, which also having just worked with directors who say that and props, like we never not just don't see it. Like, I can't just put something that's anachronistic or whatever. So I'm sure they had many, many discussions and that was pre-planned. So they knew going in, like, it's going to be packed. And I also just got a little bit of shivers thinking about trying to shoot an apartment that packed of furniture (laughs) and stuff because it's just like, oh, God. It should win everything. It should. It won't, but it should. (laughs) I was saying they just might. We'll see. I hope so. We'll see. Well, we've got two more films on our list. Fourth up. Martin McDonough is nominated for the Banshees of Inishirin. I love Martin McDonough. I, I didn't know him from his theater work or his plays. I think now that the Coen brothers have sort of seemingly disbanded, he's maybe the closest thing to we, we have to them in terms of mixing violence with a, with a sense of humor and a sense of melancholy. I thought the performances were beautiful. It's such a small movie. It's not, you know, talking about everything everywhere or talking about Top Gun. There's nothing complicated about that. It's just people and relationships and some beautiful Irish scenery and 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 a donkey and a and a horse. <laughs> but yeah, I really I, I actually was more moved by the film than I even expected to be because his other film, whether it's in Bruges or Seven Psychopaths or anything like that, I enjoy them, but I don't connect with anybody. And in this film, I connected with Colin Farrell's character. I wanted this reunification of this friendship. And I knew being Martin McDonough that it was probably not going to happen. <laughs> but I, I just I really enjoyed the film. Is that a, a Freudian slip there with the reunification? Because I, <laughs> with the use of that word, because I think that the Irish story as a whole is a big backdrop to this thing that never really gets explained for the everyday Joe. Like this war is taking place on the mainland. Like it's, it's something that uh, you keep hearing and sort of seeing, but it's not actually part of the story. And then you have this, comical violence of mutilating yourself like is that what the irish were doing with the civil war mutilating their self and what was about the fact that the war, people keep saying the war is going to be over in six months like you know that that whole thing did i just confuse belfast with this movie or did that actually happen i don't even know anymore they're hearing the bombs across the water throughout the movie right and occasionally seeing explosions it happens once a year where I'm like, if I was a senior in film school right now, I would write about this movie. Like, I'd like to see the paper that someone will write that coincides with the history and then hear what Martin McDonough has to say about it after the fact, too. Because right now, all we're hearing about is Jenny the donkey. Like, in all the interviews, it's all about Jenny the donkey, which is lovely. I'm all about animals playing a big part (laughs) as long as I'm not working on the movie I'm very (laughs) happy to let animals play such a big part in the story but uh, it's just I I think it's a very simple film that has a whole lot going on underneath the surface side story I uh, watched it with my mother and the first time Brendan Gleeson cuts off a finger my mom's like what is happening (laughs) she did she's like I'm so confused (laughs) And then when he reads the note that it might happen again, literally just all of it was all just over her head, did not like took it at face value as opposed to, no, it's a bigger 
story of like he's cutting off his access to music to do the like it's a whole thing like all right mom have some more wine i can't i don't know but yeah there's just more to it that's when i think i might go back and watch again because there's a lot more to it than the first time you watch it yeah there's also the the, the barry kogan character who hasn't really gotten as much attention from the actors out there but there's a heartbreaking scene between him and uh the sister colin farrell's sister Carrie O'Malley, right uh condon. Condon, maybe carrie condon yeah condon, condon, yeah, condon. condon. yes 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 yeah yes. so there's just a scene by standing by this water and it's a heartbreaking scene it's really an impressive piece of work by the two of them so yeah there's a there's a lot going on in this movie that's seemingly just about one guy that wants to end a friendship Here's the thing. This is my favorite of his films, but I really didn't think he nailed Seven Psychopaths or In Bruges. I think, Sean, you talking about the Coen brothers. I think they set the bar for me so much higher than he's been able to achieve. And I hated Three Billboards. I just thought it was completely wrong. And so this one, I think, is solid. And I think the acting solid. But I feel like in the end, you say there's a lot going on there, but I feel like there needed to be more actually realized there needed to be more answer there needed to be more to the story than just i think there's a small bit at the end that gives some context but overall i thought it was beautiful to watch and the acting's great but i wasn't left with much on it and honestly that lowered it on my expectations i thought it was a good film this year but i don't know that it deserves the accolades again of being on the list of the best five directed films in my opinion it was my number six yeah, I completely, as much as I enjoyed it, it didn't make it into my top five for the nominations, but none of them did except for everything. <laughs> it's okay. I, every year I feel like I find myself further off the mark of what everyone quote unquote likes versus what I thought was great. Sean, I'd explore that a little more, Sean, because you said you and you didn't love those other films, but you enjoyed them. Do you see sort of an evolution of Martin McDonough's on this, or again, or do you think that this is sort of yeah, no, I what he did I, before? I but just I don't know. It's in some ways the fact that it's simpler. His excesses of the other films do not manifest here, and I think that's to the movie's credit. But uh, but it wasn't enough to sort of to sell me on it overall. But I'd like to hear more. If, if you no, I do think I agree with you. I think that there's an evolution of him as a filmmaker. And I do think this is his best film. And also it's his most stripped down. There's always a lot of stuff. There's there's crazy gunfire going on or there's some, you know, madness going on in his other movies or there's just really large casts like three billboards. And this is kind of like, you know, a, a, a small story that has bigger underpinnings if if you care to dig into them. And so I do think as a filmmaker, he's sort of evolving and we're getting to see that. And I, and I agree with you that I think this is probably the best thing he's done. There's no other thoughts on that. We'll move on to the fifth and final film on our list. Some guy named Steven Spielberg has been nominated for The Fablements. I mean, I'll go. I mean, talk about preaching to the choir. I mean, besides the fact that it's Spielberg, he made a movie about loving to make movies let me ask you this everyone here how many of us within a hundred feet of you have a framed movie poster on your wall <laughs> yeah. yeah like three out of five at minimum <laughs> and the others are probably just a little bit more than a hundred feet so you're making a movie about learning what movies bring and how much you would love making movies that just preaches to all of us because is it a movie about loving to make movies or is it a movie about his mother both yeah I, I think it's both i think it's loving to make movies but also like his how his relationship with his mother taught him that the art he wanted to follow was making movies and then with that it was okay that he that he could consider yeah. that as a thing exactly to be. exactly or is it a movie about coming of age with a very dull high school sequence where nothing very interesting actually happens or new or, or fun at all. I'm going to go, I, I didn't like this movie. I'll, I'll jump ahead and go ahead and say, I didn't like this movie, but I'd love to hear more about what all of you thought before I go into detail. I thought the underlying story with the mother was wonderful. I really, it, it broke my heart a few times, it made me emotional. And I've never, I don't think I've ever cried at a Steven Spielberg movie. So I might've cried at you didn't one? cry at E.T.? <laughs> no. no. 
Heart of Stone. <laughs> I think I was I think I was in second grade when I saw ET, so I might have not gotten the full weight of it. But but uh, but <laughs> yeah, like I, I didn't. And, I mean, and, and to talk about high school, I mean, isn't it high school just boring? Isn't it just bullies and yeah, you know, trying to make out with a girl and or a boy, and it's just just boring. High school is just dull. So, so I, I could see the sequences being dull in high school being all right, but but I think the underlying story really was how his the relationship with his mother helped make him a filmmaker. It definitely was the most interesting part of this. It was the surprising part of the story to me was the relationship with the mother, and I, and I and there were definitely points where I got mad at her myself, where I was like, "Why are you putting all this on a little kid? All this emotional weight on." Like if that really happened, I don't know. It gave, it gave me a different perspective of the more than just asking who's paying for processing all this film that he's shooting, <laughs> which is what I've been asking ever <laughs> since the first time I saw a documentary about Steven Spielberg. Dad was making dad was making really good money. Yes, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, oh, he still was a poor little rich kid. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. But it was I went in. As I think you were saying, I think you like you didn't like it more. But yes, I definitely went in wanting to hate it and came out going, oh, it was good. I still wouldn't give it the awards, but uh, yeah, I'll I'll give them the nomination this time. But I am a little tired of him getting nominated every single time, whether he deserves it or not. You don't think he deserves it for this? No, I think he deserves it for this. I don't think he deserved it last year for West Side Story, but that's a separate. I agree. Thing. That's what I mean. Like I it's, it's, you know, it's, it's to the point where it's like it, the Henry Fonda story of I just let my wife fill out the card. You know, who's making these votes? Are they just voting for Steven Spielberg, or are they actually watching the movies? I'm gonna guess, given the vast majority of the DGA population, they're actually watching that one, but they're not watching any of the others. Yeah, that's another good point. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm I'm in this industry. I don't know how many of you are, but oh, I'm are you, industry. Sean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am uh, because of Spielberg, uh, the 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 one two punch of ET and Raiders, or rather Raiders and ET, is what made me aware that there was a job where you could tell stories or be a that part was, of who them. shot Liberty Valance. That was your like that moment for him in the movie. Yeah, it was it was you know formative for me. So I've been a fan of his my whole life i've read all the books there wasn't a lot of this that i didn't know about i mean even if if you look at his other films close encounters is about a divorce right it's it's about a man basically walking away from his family and if you ever watch spielberg on inside the actor's studio james lipton said your father was a computer scientist your mother was a classically trained pianist how do the aliens and the humans communicate at the end of close encounters and he went oh I never thought of that, but he's like, yeah, they use computers to make music, right? So every movie we've ever seen, whether it's E.T. or Close Encounters or whatever, there's some element of him in it, which when you go back and now you have this movie to sort of look at as a barometer of that, there's so much. I did love the movie. The high school stuff at the end, yeah, I agree, Skid. It wasn't, it almost felt like remnants of West Side Story last year, you know, costume thing. But, but I did really like it. I, I love seeing sort of what his mother did to him, not only the good things, but the bad things too. And that sort of hit for me too, because I was raised by a single mom and there was a lot of stuff in there that I sort of was like, ooh, that hits close. I did really enjoy the film. It's not, it's not my favorite of the year, but I, I'm glad I got to see it. It might be different for me, Sean, because when you talk about the films that got you going, it occurs to me that I think maybe Angel Heart is the film that made me realize there was work to be done here. So as far as working in the industry, I think back about what motivated me and when I really felt like, wow, that's uh, that's something else. But no, I, I don't think it was E.T. And, and Raiders for me. I do think that Spielberg was also hurt for me this year in the sense that I went to the theater and saw the 3D version of Jaws that they released remastered and released and it's fantastic and it works in 3d like it's not just a post like everything is just so great about it and it so it made me sort of feel like you know spielberg can make anything he wants anything he wants to do is going to get greenlit 
he should be doing better than this. And honestly, I also have not forgiven him for West Side Story yet. He hasn't had a proper mea culpa as far as I'm concerned on that. At least he didn't make Lawrence of Arabia. Although, Bill, maybe that's next, as you brought up last year. That's still on his list. So we'll see. Biggest, My biggest fear. My biggest fear. <laughs> It's a, it's a it is a forty million dollar therapy session. Let's, let's, let's <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. I, I, but, but but I think that's what made it great. It was a personal story, right? And yeah. I didn't think that yeah. Spielberg would make something so personal. I, I would I would like to see the PAs that all the PAs that have ever worked for him, like that uh, Bravo show. I want to see their reaction to his Golden Globe speech when he said uh, that I'm always good to all my PAs. I want to see what his PAs actually say about that. But that was really cool that he gave a shout out to his PAs, I thought. <laughs> Sean, you PA for him, right? No, I was not a PA on those. I, I did Catch Me and I did uh, Crystal Skull and I was working for Cast. But I would say that he treats everybody very well and makes sure that when he does the champagne toasts at the start that everybody's included. And this movie, his normal first was not available. His normal first, Adam Sumner, was off with Scorsese. Mm -hmm. colors of the flower moon so he had josh mclaughlin who i did pa for and who if you've ever met him has a very different vibe to adam sumner i was really <laughs> surprised when i saw his name in the credits Re really oh okay yeah exactly skid did you ever work with him he's he's i haven't worked with josh i have worked with adam in fact adam's been a guest on the show so i'm i'm still in touch with him but josh is runs a set like a military like he calls his group the zulu squad and they have like you know he gives out awards at the end of the movies and stuff. So he has a very interesting sort of bedside manner, which to me, I was like, I cannot picture him working with Spielberg. But uh, yeah, that must have been an interesting change up for Steven. Like a really good one. I'm also a sucker for a shot at, like on a movie studio, appreciating being on a movie studio. That last yeah. shot is one of the greatest last shots of a movie. It sums up the story really well. And then, as the camera moves to adjust the horizon line. I'm like, come that was, on. <laughs> that was a great joke. That's just yeah. icing on the cake. I'm like, That's you know, here's the, here's the most interesting thing about that. That was not supposed to be what ended the movie. Really? The movie was just supposed to end with actual Spielberg saying cut, and then it would go to black. The kid was going to walk up the alley. One more thing he stole from my short film, my senior <laughs> year of college. <laughs> that's that's how. That's exactly how my senior thesis <laughs> film ends. Cuts back, and I'm standing there. Cut. That must be why they changed it, Bill. Uh, uh, probably <laughs> should be. The John Ford scene was the uh, the scene for me where it was. All those, you know, the the pan around the room with the posters, and I'm I'm like my jaws open, and I'm I'm stroking my beard and looking at them and in amazement, and then I'm like, I bet nobody knows who what these fucking movies are except for <laughs> you know, the handful of us of us old western people. Like, I mean, John Ford's definitely one of my like I. I know it's uh, against the uh, Diné, uh, since you saw Dark Twins, it's against the uh, Diné people, I'm sure. But I want my ashes sprinkled on John Ford's point in Monument Valley. The fact that you could put a camera on John Ford's point and shoot just in every direction, you could shoot a whole different sequence. And I'm sure that's what they did. That the John, John Ford scene with David Lynch, especially, sorry, spoiler Perfect. alert, yes. was uh, just amazing. And also the nicety of walking into a studio and getting an interview. And isn't this great to a young kid who just walks in? Oh, do you want like, that's never going to happen nowadays. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> and that's great. And it right. happened phenomenal. Never going to happen. <laughs> a line of kids from Arizona standing out <laughs> on a Kalanga Boulevard right now, <laughs> trying to trying to break into the universal life. <laughs> I mean, that's what I did. That That's how I started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that moment is the moment in the film by far. Yeah. And the fact that he he had no idea whose office he was going into. And he said before that that is literally what happened, that the secretary ran in with a bunch of Kleenex to take the lipstick marks off of John oh Ford's God. face at like whatever he was, 75, 80 years old. So <laughs> incredible. Yeah, it's a solid film, but he owes us better. So. <laughs> We'll see what he does for next year. All right, <laughs> let's go around. Uh, rank the five films from best to worst. Tar, Top Gun Maverick, Everything Everywhere All at Once, The Banshees of Inishirin, and The Fablements. Uh, I'll say Everything first, Tar second, 
Banshee's third, Fableman's fourth, Top Gun fifth. Thanks, Bill. Uh, everything, everywhere, Fableman's, Top Gun, Banshee's, and Tar. Everything, everywhere, Tar, Fableman's, Banshee's, Top Gun. And I'm going to go uh, everything, everywhere, Fableman's, Banshee's, Top Gun, and Tar. All right, none of you got the right answers. That is, <laughs> and it doesn't matter what people vote, but in order of the best film to the worst on this list, Everything Everywhere All at Once is number one. Tar is number two. Top Gun Maverick is number three. Banshees is four, and Fableman's is five. Those are the answers. So, but good try, everybody. Nice guesses. Uh, <laughs> wonderful seeing you guys, as always. Let me throw some closing credits in there. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music, John Juan for our logo. And all of our listeners, I appreciate you. Don't forget, as said, we're going to be dropping those Oscar episodes as soon as I can get them recorded and edited. We'll be running those episodes between now and the ceremony itself on March 12th. Thanks again from Below the Line.